our Bibles to the Gospel of John, chapter number 3, if you would. John chapter number 3, and we'll be reading verses 1 through 7. Now, uh, it, it's a very familiar passage, uh, but, but I'd ask you to do this this morning. Uh, don't let your familiarity with this passage keep you from hearing what it says. So many times we have these famous places in the Bible. If you've been around church for any length of time, uh, you may have memorized them. And uh, when somebody says, turn to it, you go, oh, no. We've heard a message on that before. Well, I have to say that uh, eventually you're going to hear a message on everything in this Bible if you live long enough, at least once, maybe twice, sometimes maybe three times. In this case, uh, it's some words that we look at, we read, we recognize, but do we really understand them? Chapter number three, verse number one. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. For no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Now before your mind goes to that particular, hey, there's nothing in this passage about baptism. If every time you see water, you equate that to baptism, I've said it before, let me take you to the water fountain and buy you a drink of baptism. Because Every time there's certain uh, people with perspectives that when they see water in the New Testament, they immediately say he's talking about baptism. Well, not so in this case. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, Ye must be born again. Nicodemus, of course, was a Pharisee. Not necessarily we go into all the details of what a Pharisee was, but let's try to equate it to something we can relate to. He was the, a moralist. He lived by the law and was proud of it. He was deeply religious and conscious of every activity. In fact, the Bible says he was a ruler of the Jews and he took that religiosity and he turned it into political power amongst the Jewish people. Uh, he was a man who fasted and prayed constantly. He went to the temple every Sabbath. He didn't miss a one and every feast you could count that Nicodemus would be there and probably amongst those who were conducting the services. And yet there was something empty in his soul. He, uh, he was missing something. And so in his timidity, he came to Jesus by night. Now you'll find by night mentioned with the name Nicodemus in other, another place or two in the New Testament. I don't really know what that means. It could mean that he was ashamed. It could mean that he was fearful of uh, ruining his reputation. It could mean that he was just out and about at night. It really doesn't matter. He came to Jesus is what's, what matters. In fact, he's the only Pharisee that we have in the New Testament that did just that. Now, you know, you'll find that in most cases, the Lord Jesus allows himself to appear to those who are generally the down and outers, the sinners, 
In fact, the Bible says that the Lord came to seek and to save that which was lost. Nicodemus didn't think himself to be lost. He was of proud religious her uh, heritage. He had it all. I don't think he even approached Jesus trying to, to understand that he was the Messiah. But he did go to the Lord Jesus over some theological questions that he had. In fact, he acknowledged something about the Lord Jesus. Early on in verse number two, he called him rabbi, which was uh, the description of what was a master teacher in Israel. Now, there were many, many people who taught the scriptures, the Old Testament scriptures, but in Nicodemus' case, he was at the top of the academic world. He was considered the best, most influential, most authoritative speaker in the area. And so Nicodemus looked at the Lord Jesus and he called him by that authoritative name, which I appreciate uh, his understanding of him at least that much, don't you? Yes, he was a great teacher. He wrote the book that he was teaching. So he knew all about it. No one would know the scripture any more than the author of the scripture. So he was known to be a great teacher and Nicodemus certainly recognized that. And so he says, Rabbi, he says to him, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. Now he got close, but he should have said, we know that thou art our teacher and God. <laughs> but he wasn't willing to claim that yet. So he kind of shows us of those who are holding on to their religion, their moralist lifestyle, their legalist approach to religion, thinking somehow that that's going to equate to salvation. And it does not, and it will not. Thank God for the blind man. He says, I know not how all this happened to me, but one thing I know, I was blind, and now I see. He realized that, listen, he didn't have all the answers. He certainly couldn't give it an understanding, but he knew this. He'd encountered the Almighty God. And he said, I, I know he healed me of that which kept me from seeing. And so he said, no man can do these miracles that thou doest. And he had done many, except God be with him. Ah, yeah. He and the Father are one. <laughs> God is in him. He is in the Father and they are one. So he didn't recognize that. He tried hard. But the Lord looked through all of that approach as planned as it was by Nicodemus. As studied out as it was by Nicodemus. The Lord looked through all of his inquisitive mind and got right to the core of the problem. He said to him, Nicodemus, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So Nicodemus had a great emptiness in his soul that the Lord wanted to reveal. Now, you know, the Lord Jesus he knew the hearts of people. He, he knows today the hearts of people. I believe it was in John chapter 2 and verse 23, just a couple of verses up. Look at that, John 2, 23. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover in the feast day, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men. These were fake believers. They only believed because of the supernatural act. They didn't have faith in him being the Messiah, the Son of God. 
but they were no like less enamored by what he saw, and I suspect that's just human. But it's odd when you look into the Talmud, the old Jewish uh, rituals and writings. The Lord Jesus is described early on in their uh, report as being one who was a shyster. They, they said the Lord Jesus was a con artist. And that's really what they thought of him. And the Lord, he knew who he was dealing with. Yeah, they liked to see uh, the blind healed and the deaf giving hearing. Uh, that was pretty fascinating. But he was doing those miracles to the lost sheep of the house of Israel because they'd require a sign. Paul wrote that. Greeks require wisdom, but the Jews require a sign. Uh, look what Moses went through to get them to follow him out of the land of Egypt. He had to have all kind of miracle signs before they would even begin to follow him. And so the Lord Jesus was ministering as to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But notice verse 25 of chapter 2, and that goes to the point of our point. And needed not that any man should testify of him, for he knew what was in the heart of man. You know why he knows what's in the heart of man? Because he's God, the all-knowing God. He knew what was in their heart. There's another place in the Gospel of John where it mentions uh, that he knew what was in the heart of man. And uh, we won't go to that, I don't think, at this point. Uh, but, but he pointed it out, you know, that, uh, that they may try to pretend to be on his side, but he really knew their motivation. That's why when he looked at Nicodemus, he said to him, if you let me translate into Southern vernacular, quit conning around, Nicodemus. Quit trying to hide what's really your problem. Quit pretending to be somebody that I know you're not. <laughs> you're a lost sinner, Nicodemus. And you, the great teacher, the great ruler of the Jews, the great faster, the great prayer warrior, the great studier of the scriptures. You, Nicodemus, are no different than any other sinner. You must be born again. That's what he told him. And so one thing about it, everybody can tell the difference that's saved today between born again people and lost people. Now, now, I'm not saying you can tell a difference between members of churches all over the globe today because you'll find in that group just about everything and anything. But you also know that a born-again believer is different from a non-believer. Now, in the age that we live in, we don't know. There's a lot of pretenders. I read an article this past week of the Super Bowl uh, between the Tampa Bay Buccaneers and the Kansas City Chiefs during COVID year. And do you realize that, you may not remember this, they only allowed 20,000 people in Raymond James' studio because of COVID, you had to you know, space out. So to fill up those other 50,000 seats, they had cardboard cutouts of fans who took pictures of themselves and if you paid a hundred dollars you could get your face on one of those cardboard cutouts and you would appear as the tv camera scan it raised over three million dollars doing this but they scanned the the stadium during this super bowl and it was obvious to the viewers that these were fake fans <laughs> Because you see, they didn't act like, everybody knows when you go to a, a sporting event that during the game, people are milling about, going to concession stands and talking with each other. And, but all you saw in that stadium was a sea of faces that didn't move, didn't holler, didn't scream, didn't get up, didn't eat peanuts, didn't drink Coke and whatever else they drink. 
and just were cardboard cutouts. Nicodemus, he was a fake person. He had interest, but not enough to declare Jesus by faith, the Son of God. He didn't have that. And so what the Lord Jesus said to him, he says to us today. You know, these words, the Bible said, heaven and earth shall pass away. My words shall not pass away. Now, we've been 2,000 years since these words were spoken on this earth by our Lord. There's been a lot that changed. The world's changed incredibly. The geography of the earth has been altered and changed. People have changed. Empires have come and gone. Technology has changed. But one thing hadn't changed. What Jesus said. He said, ye must be born again. That never changes. And it will never change. It is eternal words. You can't get away from it. He said them to Nicodemus. He said them to us. But yet, uh, he also told Nicodemus that a farmer, one, I told the, the disciples one day that a farmer went out to plant a field and he sowed it in wheat. And then uh, and at night, an enemy came in and sowed tares amongst the wheat. The owner came to the workers and he said, you need to go. Uh, uh, he said to the workers, he said, I went out there in the field looking at y'all's crop I've left y'all responsible for and you got a bunch of weeds growing in it. And they said, okay, you want us to pull all those weeds up? He said, no, no, don't pull the weeds up yet. He said, when the harvest comes, we'll pull them up. But if you pull up the weeds, if you think you're smart enough to do tell what's different between the weed and the tear and the, and the wheat and the tear. You're going to mess up. You may disturb the roots of the very wheat itself. And so what the message that the Lord Jesus gives to Nicodemus is the message that we should be preaching and teaching and sharing with our uh, friends and relatives. You cannot get to heaven on religion. You can't get to heaven on some type of false piety. You can't be self-righteous enough. You may not do anything or even go with the ones that do. That's not enough to get you to heaven. You cannot get to heaven on anything you can do or anything man can do for you. <laughs> Doesn't matter. You know, there are countless Thousands, maybe millions of people around the world where some organization, some religious organization declares people saved. You cannot be declared saved by man. I can't tell you you're saved. You can't tell me I'm saved. Only God can declare you saved. That's it. And so that's why you preach and teach you must be born again. Now you couldn't help Get your own birth here. There was nothing you could do. Listen, you were conceived and birthed without any help from yourself. You were helpless. Could you imagine the little baby in the womb saying, hey, we should have had this thing done 15 minutes ago. How come you left me in here? It's time to, I'm fixed to just go ahead and take things in my own hands. You know, that's absurd and silly. But there's a lot of folks out here trying to deal with salvation like that. They think they're going to fix it themselves. They think somehow if I, uh, you know, go here and go to church and do all these things, that somehow I'm going to be declared saved. And it will not happen. So the Lord told him, he said, you must be born again. And notice he also told him it's, it's from above. He said, God will birth you. First John, I mean, John chapter 1, look back in verse 13 of the same chapter, two, uh, same book, two chapters back, John 1 and verse number 13. Verse 12 says, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. 
which were born. And notice that, they're born. They're not made. They're born. It's something new happening. There's nothing, they're, they're not being rehabilitated. They're not being uh, reconstructed. They're not even being remodeled. This new life is a life of born. It has a beginning. It wasn't in existence. Which were born not of blood. No DNA. I, I, I can't tell you how many people over the years I've said, are you saved? And they said, well, my granddaddy was a Baptist preacher. Well, at this point in life, I'd say, God help you. I mean, I, mean, I know it's kind of maybe off color, but uh, I uh, are off the wall. Uh, when young men come up and say, I've been called to preach, I say, Lord help you. <laughs> Be praying for you. But here he says, not of blood, it's not of DNA. I don't care if, if the last 10 generations were Baptist preachers. You're lost if you've not been born again. Nor of the will of flesh. That's what Nicodemus was depending on, the will of the flesh. He said, I'm going to study the scripture. I'm going to devote myself to fasting. I'm going to give my way to prayer. I'm going to attend the services. I'm going to be teachers and rulers over men. I'm going to do all the things. I'm going to be follow the law. I mean, even the apostle Paul, if you remember him, he said, I was a Pharisee. As touching the law, I was blameless. So a Pharisee was mad about thinking that the law was going to do something for him. Well, he said, it won't be of the will of man. You can, you can count on that. But he said, or, or the will of the flesh, but he said, nor the will of man. And we just covered that. He, we talked about those who were being tried to be declared. If you keep, keep catechism, you know, they got a group out there say, if you go on this mission trip for two years, and ride a bicycle around the neighborhoods, somehow that's going to make you saved. It isn't going to happen. Based on the book itself, it declares it will not be of the will of man, nor of your flesh. That's it. And when that's all passed, he lays it out to them exactly what it was. In fact, he got to where he could sort them out by his preaching. Remember there was one place where the Lord did miracles and the multitude, I think it was the loaves and fishes, they were, they were following him and then he began to preach to them and it says, and they walked with him no more. <laughs> we don't want this. He's asking for our yielding to complete rulership where he's wanting us to take up our cross and follow him. That means we're going to have to be obedient. That's not what we signed up for. We signed up for the miracles and all the good things. We like the food, the miracles, and all of that. And he said, no, you're going to have to follow me, and I'll, I'll teach you. And the Bible says, and many walk no more with him. Just like cardboard cutouts in a stadium. They're fake just like tares amongst the wheat. They're fake. And the way you turn out to be real is being born again. That makes you real. Let me tell you what, uh, that, that's called regeneration. That's a word used in the New Testament. Uh, I'll read it to you. Paul wrote to T Titus, he said, but after the, that the kindness and love of God our Savior towards men appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we've done. You can't somehow figure out how you're going to work your way to heaven. You're going to miss heaven a million miles by your works of righteousness. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but, but according to his mercy, he saved us. Only God can save. Salvation is from the Lord. That's the only way you can get it. By the washing of regeneration. That's taking that which was dead and making it alive. Paul wrote, ye who were dead in trespasses and sin. 
have now been made alive through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he took that which was without life and he regenerated it to make it have life. You see, even the biological components to the birth of a human child, that baby, as I said, did not have any part in the seed that was planted, nor the womb that birthed it. But that baby comes out alive. I'm telling you, the new birth comes from above. It's of God. We can't replicate it through good works. We can't replicate it through sacrificial giving. We can't replicate it, replicate it through reformation. I mean, thank God for reformation, but that doesn't produce the new birth. I mean, you could go on. Or you can't replicate the new birth through church membership. Now, I think every born-again believer ought to be part of a church. You see, going to church doesn't save you. Going to church allows you to meet. It's the home of the saints. It's the home of the saved people. We come here because we come together to worship God as born-again believers. Now that term born-again back in, I remember back, it came out during Jimmy Carter's days uh, if you were alive during that time. But uh, remember it got to be real famous. And uh, everybody said, I'm born again, I'm born again, I'm born again, I'm born again. <laughs> and uh, even uh, some of the major periodical magazines came out with... Uh, full page front covers, born again. <laughs> and of course the world got to where they got making fun of that term. And to this day they still do. But there's nothing to be made fun of. It's the difference between eternal life and eternal death. It's a good difference between heaven and hell. It's the difference between death and life. Well, Paul, he understood it. Now we can use a lot of words to equate salvation. I, I could use the word converted. I can use the word redeemed. That's a Bible name for salvation. I can use the word justified. I can use the word sanctified. You see, all of these words point to different aspects of salvation. But they're all in the whole salvation. But there's no more clear description of salvation than what the Lord Jesus used to old Nicodemus. Ye must be born again. <laughs> you can't get any clearer than that. You know what? But Nicodemus, he said, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Let, let me see if I got this. He said, how can a man be born when he's old? <laughs> And so where the Lord was talking to him about a spiritual birth, he could only relate to a physical birth. And so how, how, you know, he's not the only one that said that. You remember when the angel told Mary that she was going to be with a child? You know what she said? Wait a minute. How can I have a child when I've not been with a man? How can this be? Well, in this case, the Lord laid it out to him. He said, except, he, said, he, he said, except a man be born of the water, which no doubt in my mind he was equating to the birth out of the womb because that's the context of me. I've heard all kind of uh, descriptions of that. And hey, listen, uh, how people look at it, we'll have to uh, see when we get to heaven. But I think it clear in verse number four, when Nicodemus said, how can man be born when he's old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Lord said, immediately, he didn't wait for hours and days. He said, no, in that light, except a man be born of the water and of the spirit. Now, I know there's some argument that could be the word of God. And hey, I don't fault folks for that. 
But in my view, it is in the uh, argument with the natural birth and the spiritual birth. Nicodemus didn't understand it. He was only in the natural. And the Lord said, it's more than just having a natural birth. It's, it's about God doing that to your soul in the spiritual world. That's why we're de declared we're dead in trespasses sin. Yeah, the old body's walking around, but that soul without Christ is dead. There's no life in it. And the Bible tells us there in verse 6, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. It's a mysterious thing. In fact, in verse 8, it says, The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but thou but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is everyone that is born of the spirit. If you're looking to be able to fully grasp this truth, you're going to find out you won't ever understand it this side of heaven. Even the Bible tells us that the angels desired to look on it. They go, we've never seen anything like this. You take a, a man who's dead in trespasses and sin, he's got no life in him, his body's walking around like one, a night of the walking dead. And out of nowhere, God ignites him with the life of God. Creates him anew. We're told that therefore, if any man be in Christ Jesus, he is a new creature, not a revamped one, not a rehabbed one, not a reconstruction one or a remodeled one. He's a brand new creature. The word birth and the new creation ought to draw parallels in our minds towards the spiritual. Nicodemus, apparently one day his light came on. Because when the Lord Jesus, and I believe it was the same Nicodemus. I, I know there's debate about that. But I think when one came to get the Lord Jesus off the cross and put him in his own tomb, uh, I believe Nicodemus was part of the ones that directed that. We know he was buried in Joseph of Arimathea, but I, one day we'll look at that. Uh, but I think he was there in the end. Can't prove it, but it sure seems to be. And so as we see this text, as we draw down to it, you can't help but understand it is, it is an act of God. It's God's plan, God's way, and you could go on and on through the scripture and see it over and over again that he claims, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, Peter said, according to his abundant mercy, which hath begotten us. That's called the birth. Unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Paul knew it. He says, likewise, reckon yourself to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. It says, but God who is rich in mercy where for his great love wherein he loved us even when we were dead in sins hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace you're saved. And then the apostle James got in on it. He says every good gift and every perfect, perfect gift is from above. He had just got finished in his first chapter drawing a conclusion, an analogy between a, a, sin, a temptation, lust, sin, and death. That's man's way. But he says at the close of that passage, he says every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning, of his own will begat he us with the word of truth, that we should be the kind of first fruits of his creatures. And so God's salvation comes from God. Peter wrote, being born again, in, in comparison to man's biological action of the birth of a child. He draws a analogy. Being born again, not of corruptible seed. 
See, if you get born of DNA, the Bible says it's appointed unto man once to die. And after this, the judgment. We know that if you are birthed only by human parents, you are birthed with corruptible seed because you're going to die. I mean, you don't have to get very old to figure that out. When God births you through the spiritual seed, the Word of God, the Bible says, not of incorruptible, but by the Word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. When you get the new birth through the Word of God, that seed being planted into you and the igniting of the Holy Spirit of God, you become begotten of God. In fact, we're told we are the children of God by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. I hope you've been born again today. And there's nowhere I have any desire and I hope I hadn't drawn any kind of doubt. Listen, it's not about drawing doubt. It's about realizing if you're not born again, you need to be born again. And God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And He will instill with you that gift, that good and beautiful gift. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Today is the day of salvation. Let's bow our heads together for you. Paul knew it. Peter knew it. James knew it. It's about a new birth. And the Lord Jesus taught it and is the author of it to Nicodemus. If you're here today without Christ, we'll be singing an invitation hymn. And as we sing this hymn, if you'll step out of the pew where you're at, we'll be glad to meet you at the front. Take the word of God, the incorruptible seed, and give you proof of what it means to be saved. And you can trust the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior today. We'll be with you. We'll help you. We'll, we'll lead you in prayer. You can ask Christ to be your Savior. Lord, we pray the Holy Spirit of God would speak to our hearts. And we don't know, Lord, who's listening. We know that God's word will not return void. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.